the first session is by Srinath Hare Iyengar. He says he is dual qualified, he is a techno legal lawyer with 20 plus years of experience as advocate, India and solicitor in UK. Both are the places I am interested in. My daughter lives in UK. 10 years of litigation experience and 10 years of experience as in-house corporate counsel in IT industry. Uh, HCL Technologies, Sutherland, Ramco Systems, Photon Interactive. Okay. His qualification is BSc Mathematics, LLB, LLM, Criminology, Department of International, sorry, uh, sorry, Diploma in International and Banking, uh, Transaction, University of San Diego, California, USA. So he is going to speak on AI and the legal field. I'm sure this is a very interesting topic. We need to understand the legal implications of artificial intelligence. Over to you, Srinath. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so essentially, I'm going to cover this topic on artificial intelligence and the legal field. So I would say intelligence has become artificial and life has become virtual. <laughs> and beyond this, there is something called the unmanifested substratum. Nice word, no? Do a Google, you'll know. So essentially, everything goes, ends up there. So let's start with the first slide. So I was just doing all this research on AI and all that, and suddenly I felt, do I really know what I'm talking about? So I'm just here to tell you that I'm just trying to transmit the information that I have assimilated over a period of time during the course of my practice. And uh, while doing this uh, input gathering, I just came across one, this, one of this sayings from Stephen Hawking. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. I was compelled to put this because as I kept researching on the legal implication on AI, I really didn't know whether I was doing right, whether it was going on the right track, whether the legal industry or the fraternity is even aware of what is happening. Or am I just saying, yeah, I know everything and I'm going to do this and whether I'm right in doing that. So without wasting, and that's why I say learning continues. It's an unending process. And uh, the convergence of technology and the legal field is a very interesting uh, combination because you need to regulate every industry that is going on. You have the IT industry, which is into developing softwares. You have issues which happens in the IT industry, and we deal with it. Those are typical contractual disputes that you see. But beyond that, with the advent of information flowing across the globe, the globe has shrunk. Earlier, if you said there was a dispute only in India, you had disputes only in India because the transactions were limited to India. And if you had disputes outside of India, you will try to arbitrate and close it. Now, it's not like that. Any person sitting here could have his account hacked and the entire amount would just go off in a flash. And that person would be sitting in Siberia or it could be sitting somewhere else. So your jurisdiction is now expanded to the globe. So how do you deal with it? This is on the plain vanilla data hacking or the cyber crime that is happening. Now we are going to another realm where we are talking about artificial intelligence. So we are here to understand you. Of course, all of you know artificial intelligence better than me because you're from the technical field. You'll be knowing the core of it. But generally, I'm trying to cover all this area. AI in legal field, AI in landscape, in the legal field, areas of application, regulation of AI, what if scenario, and what is happening in India in terms of artificial intelligence. These are the uh, topics that I am going to cover. So on the AI front, this is just uh, information that I have pulled out. All of you know better than that. Rather than going to the first part, I would say AI is a system that learns to perform intelligent tasks. We usually think only humans can do. I would simplify further to say that we are actually making machines to think for themselves and we are creating that algorithm to understand and react and also predict. So what it was in the earlier days, 80, 1980 to 90, you had simple data, you had a rule-based analysis and you had a result. To what you have right now is all these things. You have IoT, you have inputs coming from all different things, your Alexa, all your phone, everything is becoming a source of input for the data processing. And then you have got some output which is much more sophisticated than anything. Your simple Siri on your, in your phone is a AI, which is telling you not only 
what you have to do, you say, how's the weather? It's a carry an umbrella. So we have progressed to a very large extent and still this is going to go further. These are the various sources like I mentioned. And this is an overall chart of evolution. Uh, from 1940 to 2018, we have all these things. Interestingly, a large role has been played by technology in the legal field, which we are not exposed to in India or probably not adapted to it. Uh, whereas in the Western world, there has always been an openness to adapt for technology and that has happened, which I am going to take you through. So a general uh, input on what is an AI, you have artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. This is your basic structure on an AI. How does it translate into the legal industry? Is the inputs that you are getting from different areas is what is going to be assimilated and analyzed by a machine. Where are, where are we in terms of spend? 11.35 billion euros as of Q4 2017. So that's where that spend has already happened and we are in 2018, we are almost going to complete the year. The spend would have crossed double this. This is where we start our story. AI will disrupt not just the world of practicing lawyers, but also common perception of law of the legal process. This gentleman is actually, he advises the Chief Justice of England on the IT front. So why, what has AI got to do with uh, the legal industry? Right from the beginning, I, when I was working in HCL, I was leading their LPO practice. All of you know, outsourcing has been a major chunk of work which India has been doing. Be it your call centers or be it knowledge processing, it has been an area of outsourcing which has helped India grow techno technologically. I'll come to the area where we talk about patents and we'll see where we are in the global scenario. I used to lead a team of lawyers, non-lawyers to help a law firm in the United Kingdom to do their work. What was the work we were doing? We were actually indexing, categorizing and also analyzing some of the documents. Why we were doing the simple thing that reason why all this outsourcing was happening was the cost point. Increase in profitability and saving cost. These are the two main drivers. Why do you think AI has become very critical and very essential now? The inherent factor there is cost saving and increased profitability. You moved out work force from the other parts of the world into India to outsource. Now you will use machines to do the work which is replacing people which is already evident you have chatbots. Earlier you had companies which had resources which are doing the chatting and they were responding to a customer care. Now you have a machine talking to you. In the legal industry, the cost of any work or litigation is humongous. If Has anyone dealt with any litigation or uh, legal related issue from this group? Anyone? So you know how much cost they would have incurred in a litigation. The costs are substantial and we always call it a flush tank. You know why? Because once you get into a litigation, the amount of money that you pay is like when you flush the entire source of money goes off in just one blow and that can actually affect your balance sheet. Typically a counsel and as an in-house counsel, you are supposed to deal with three main aspects of the practice. That is one is uh, contracting, one is uh, the litigation and other thing is advisory. IT industry, many of you are from the IT industry, would be aware of the contracting aspect that is involved by an IT team. You'll have a large IT team which will be just reviewing contracts in and out. You'll have the legal team which is also analyzing the litigation and all those aspects and also advising on day-to-day -day basis on what kind of transaction, how you should do and what you should not be doing. As a result, there are certain areas where you're dependent on the external law firms to help them out. 71% of the departments cite the need of increased productivity. Productivity has always been a challenge because a legal department in, an, in a co corporate is a cost center. It's not a profit center unless and until you win a case and sue the other company and earn money out of it. Uh, the other thing is the role of a general counsel has changed over a period of time. Merely from being just a touch point in case of an issue to actively participating in board meetings and giving suggestions on how you should run a business to ensure that the risk is minimized. The risk is the essential aspect here. 
So these are the statistical figures where you can see the need of improvement efficiency in the legal department. Now a general study which was done recently shows that GCs, the general counsel's performance is it one, once it comes to compliance matters, it is 80% that they have uh, an output coming in, 75% as a trusted advisor and a GC is looked in terms of maximizing value, it is just 47%. Leveraging technology, 27%, self-training is very less. Lawyers are so much involved with their day-to-day -day issues on interpreting law that they seldom have time to upgrade in terms of technology to understand where it is heading to. That's the reason why uh, this 19% is seen here. So in a nutshell, what is happening right now is the advent of technology is slowly crunching out all the menial or the day-to-day -day task from the legal department and it is already in process of being automated or being processed. Uh, I will tell you in what areas. the. Pressure right now which is coming on the corporates or the law firms as such is to reduce cost and increase efficiency. That's what the slide talks about in a nutshell. What is the landscape like? This is the landscape. Starting from drafting of contracts to contract management, legal analytics, production, uh, prediction technology, e-discovery, legal research, contract due diligence, contract review, expert automation, e-billing and IP. IP is a very critical thing, I'll get you to that, I'm sorry the slide is little uh, blur. What in terms of uh, the funding, these are all the areas that you can see where the biggest funding has happened in the past few years. As latest as March 2018, it is 3.2 million in terms of uh, production technology and this is general landscape on where the funding has gone into the legal industry. And these are some of the uh, consolidations that have happened. Uh, I don't know how much of you would be aware in terms of the names of the companies that I've mentioned here because you're not using it on day-to-day -day basis. LexisNexis is one of the bigger companies which is commonly known. DocuSign you would have seen in terms of signing execution of documents, etc. So things are moving uh, further like earlier you used to sign a document physically, now you have DocuSign. DocuSign further goes into document management. And then you have the AI part which comes into it. These are the areas, contract drafting, contract due diligence, legal research, e-discovery, as I had mentioned earlier, I just get into the details. So what exactly is a contract review? Contract review essentially is comprises of drafting, review, due diligence, contract management, extraction and analysis. These are all put together you could call a contract management when it comes all together when you're doing it. What does an in-house legal do? It spends more than 50% reviewing contracts. How many of you have interacted with your legal team in your company? And what's your... Uh, it takes months actually to decide upon, not, not just hours, but also the customers. I mean, as you're talking about, can I sign this in one hour or less, I think it should go be the current point of time. Exactly. We lawyers are going to lose jobs. <laughs> so others, your experience with the legal folks in your company? Very happy? Takes time? Very busy. <laughs> we'll have AI on HR also. Okay. So the aspect here is, I'll tell you why. Being a GC, we have worked as an in-house corporate counsel, I know. The volume of documents that come in is humongous. You have an MSA, you have an SOW, you have an SLA. You have an MSA which talks about all your legal formalities. You have an SOW which talks about one MSA will have around 50 SOWs, right? Am I competent to talk about an SOW and say that, hey, this is what your SLA should be and this is what should be the service credit. It should be 50%, it should be 30%. I am not in a position to say that. It's a delivery related decision which a delivery ops or the delivery head has to sign off on that because your entire billing is residing on that signing of SOW. What we do is we do what if analysis to say that okay the delivery guy has approved this SOW in a jiffy. What if something goes wrong? How do I close the risk or how do I mitigate the risk if something goes that's where we come. 
we come from the predictive part of it is what if something goes wrong, where do I keep the jurisdiction, shall I accept it to America, shall I go into a regular trial, should I take arbitration, all these are the questions that we will be thinking. It's not that a lawyer just comes and sees a legal aspect, a lawyer is supposed to understand the industry, the business area that he is working in and then draft a contract so that he technically identifies a risk even at 10,000 feet and gets it validated. So that's where. So the work is humongous and that's the reason why 50% of the time is consumed. Now, we are trying to crunch this and bring this like, can I sign this? There is an example over there. JP Morgan has already created a software that does in seconds what it claimed took their lawyers 360 or 1000 hours. I don't know how far like they did all this, but technology. Your billing can be on a different. Yeah, absolutely. It could, the, the, the reason why they would have put this is the hour spent on uh, getting an output in terms of a volume. So when you say billing hours, yeah, billing hours does count into, that's where the lawyers make their money, right? It could be man hours, but it translates it to only a billing hours, right? <laughs> in state is billing hours. So we have products now that is available in the market and I have put some products out there, law geeks through uh, Tree River, Beagle, NDA Legal Ro Robot. There are other many such uh, uh, products that are available. I would share my personal experience when I was in HCL and I, as uh, uh, leading the practice for LPO. We had this pressure to bring in efficiency to help them devise some things which could help reduce the time and give a better output. So there was one of these projects that I was working out is taking out of a draft of a contract by the salesperson. You have a business which spans across the globe, you have multiple jurisdictions and you want an NDA. How many of you are aware of this word NDA? All of you. You won't start a lead without an NDA, right? Right. So if you were to give an NDA out to your customer, what do you do? What do you do? Take out a template and send it to the client and then client does a red line and comes back to you because he says, hey, I am in US, I am not going to adjust to your Indian jurisdiction. I am in UK, I am not going to accept. So to overcome that problem, I was working on a project where I had clauses and all those uh, uh, provisions kept in, in a database and the moment the salesperson entered the requirement, your first level of a contract could get drafted if you said the client is from US, you would have a clause coming in which fixes in, in respect to that particular jurisdiction. So this was the level of work which I was involved in in 2007. Post that things have like migrated and you already have a contract drafting machines available. There are solutions that you can just pick it up, send it across and close it in time. The other area is due diligence. What do you know about due diligence in a contract? You got a lead, you signed a contract, you had a lot of headache with your contract in legal department. You said, hey, I want it like yesterday and he took around one week or 15 days or one month to actually send you the first draft and then the client took another one month. It took a lot of pain for you to sign a contract. You signed it. Next what? What do you do after signing a contract? Anyone here? You sleep? And there are touch points to it. PCI DMS compatibility or are you complying with that? Are you complying with the background check of your employees? Are you covered with the data protection with the new GDPR? Are you fulfilling that? Is there any data going to come out of your organization? All these things translate after you have signed the document. This is the most critical part because if you breach any of these things, you are finished. Your SOW will have service credits, you would have died, tied up to an SLA. You say L1 escalation, it has to be done within 24 hours, you have not done it. But did you even know that you signed it for? Did you even know what was defined as an L1 escalation? You didn't know that, right? That's where the whole thing is now moved to an AI kind of a configuration where your contract, whatever is signed, the essential terms are picked up and the AI keeps telling you what you need to do so that you don't miss out on deadlines, you don't miss out on pricing point, you don't miss out on the dollar exchange, currency fluctuation, etc. All these are the areas where AI is helping you now. 
So they are set of products that are there. So compliance is another critical thing. This, this compliance that I mentioned was only limited to the customers. You have regulatory compliance. Are you fulfilling that? There is an exchange of transaction. There is, is there transfer pricing involved in that particular deal? How do you know that? Who is analyzing all this? That's where this comes into picture. Did it? No. Your due diligence triggers the moment you sign it. Because you are executing the life, the terms of the contracts are being executed. Till you have signed, you can't even recognize the revenue, right? I know revenue recognition even starts before the moment you have a cup of tea with the customer, hey, the deal worth is this much, put it in the balance sheet. But the actual essence comes here. So this is where your entire thing comes in because after you have signed it, you have to ex you have executed in the spirit. You have to ensure that all the aspects are fulfilled. Yeah, yeah. You're just identifying the areas, but your implementation triggers only after signing. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Oh, I, I think that's a that's a typo. That's a repeat. Thank you. Fizzy. So where are we in relation to the contracting? This is Fizzy. AXA has already started applying smart contracts. Smart contracts are they really a contract from the legal perspective? Well, there are terms and condition. It is defining rules. Do you really call it a contract? My take at this juncture is yes. What AXA has actually done is, it has actually got a smart contract devised in such a way that in the event there is the flights are delayed, you will automatically get your compensation. So there is a rule which is defined to say that when you have to get a compensation and that has been brought in terms of a smart contract. How many of you have heard about smart contract? Blockchain. blockchain. So what exactly is a smart contract in a blockchain? Anyone? Any guess? You have actually coded the contract into the system. You have made it automated in such a way that when you put in the scenarios of if and then, your contract is automatically executed and it is fulfilled. You have the Bitcoin transaction end to end happening. You want to sell a car. In a normal course, how are you going to sell a car? You go to the broker, go to Gadi.com, put it there, somebody in. He says, how do I know you own the car, man? Is it your car? I don't know. So what are you going to do? You are going, there is, what is lacking in between the seller and the buyer is the element of trust. That trust is fulfilled by a smart contract. You have coded your entire uh, conditions. The codes, the contract is translated into codes. Your put condition, this is the car, this is the model, this is the, or, uh, this is the owner details, this is the RC book, this is the sale price. Person interested in that looks through it. You have a public key available for your transaction. The buyer has a public key. He goes in, he sees, he says, okay. The condition is you should pay, say, 1 lakh rupees or 15 lakhs, whatever is the price of your car, you are quoted. The gentleman agrees to say that, yes, I am okay for this 15 lakhs. The next process in your blockchain transaction would typically verify whether the car is available for sale, where is it available, where is it parked, whether the buyer has got sufficient funds in his uh, bank account, all these are validated, the sale takes place, the amount goes back to the seller, the buyer gets the code for the purchase of the car, takes, goes to the escrow guy or whosoever is having parked in that, gives the code, takes the car, goes off, finished. You have eliminated a chain of middlemen, you have eliminated the chain of the entire middle level transaction, you directly sold the car using a blockchain. You use the smart contract. Smart contract is nothing but coding the terms and condition into the system so that it adapts automatically. That's what AXA has done here. What if something goes wrong? Nobody knows. So it could, like for, for example, the person who is actually uh, given the code, somebody stole, steals that uh, code, goes to the dealer, takes the car, what are you going to do? So essentially somebody bought it, somebody took the delivery. Legal research is another area. Legal research is where a litigating lawyer 
has to run through the case laws that, has, that is being published every, every day, every month, Supreme Court judgments that set precedence and one has to be updated with every of those scenarios. Like for example, I'll give you one such example is where Sanjay that was let off on bail on certain grounds because he was just holding a weapon and on that certain grounds they gave him a bail. That becomes a precedence for all the lower courts and they'll cite it to attend to their cases. So as a result, the case law searches become very important. In India, you have uh, SCC online, you have Manupatra. I use Manupatra and one of the features that is very interesting for me is it actually tells which judge used which ju uh, uh, judgment, how long. You know, I am actually trying to extrapolate that which cases, which judges have actually relied on which judgments. So I am moving a step further. Then I, when I started my practice in 99, I used to practice in excise and customs. And we used to have these references. And I did my own coding to say, put the proposition and put the case law. That moved to RK Jane's excus where we started doing the search. So the whole need of uh, the, ex the book was uh, left out. Every time you have to take that uh, journals, go read, make your updation, etc. All that has gone. Now I can pull it out from the phone. Further to that is now prediction on how a judge could react in a particular situation, what kind of judgments he has relied on, on passing a judgment and I can make an accurate uh, kind of a presentation before the court. I will know exactly which judge might react on a which judgment. That's where we are going to. This is just a scenario of how this analysis is being done. This is a screenshot of one of the tools that is available in the market. E-discovery. Now, most of you will not be aware of this term e-discovery except in some of them who have actually tried to help some e-discovery companies in terms of designing their tools. E-discovery, the backdrop is in a litigation in the United States, the moment A and B are into a fight, two corporates, they list the documents that has to be produced before the court by the other side. Each one will circulate the list of documents and you are bound and obligated to give it to the court. If you do not, it will be tampering of evidence and there will be an assumption, a pre adverse presumption against you. Now, how do you call out so much of data? You will have gigabytes and terabytes of data lying with you. This was earlier done manually in the US, then it was outsourced to India, where our dudes used to sit on the system and call out all the information and give it manually. So then, during that period, uh, 2008, 7-8, they had this whole concept of e-discovery ready. So, you had companies which actually scanned through the whole set of documents, digitized the whole thing. So when you did a search, you could pull out. Now, we moved a first step further, where the lawyer is actually sending the rules one by one, and the engine is actually, AI engine is working and culling out all the information and throwing out to you. So the moment you put a proposition that this is a litigation, this is a scenario in which I need to pull out document, AI is going in and searching and pulling out and giving it to you. Probably it could also save the chances of you losing or winning. And what's the market size? 18.49 billion. That's where we are looking out. This is the most interesting part when I was doing my study. Where has IP gone? This is a very interesting area that I, I really was fascinated. When I was actually involved in uh, filing patents for Microsoft, we were doing it from India during the daytime, like US is sleeping and in India, the Indian resources start filing, right? So the whole process in an invention or a filing of a patent is you have a discovery or you have an invention. You reduce that into an expression and before even you file it, you do a patent search, you do a prior art search to check if there is something similar to it. This is not an easy task, believe me. It's a very painful task and you spend hours and hours and hours to extract all the patents from different uh, 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 sites, check, verify, and then you come down and draft. And the other aspect is when you are actually mapping the patents with the particular uh, features that they have, it's a other humongous task to see whether it is mapping, it is not mapping to avoid a possible infringement and to protect yourself. All that is now handled by AI. AI is used to do a prior art search. It is also used to check up the landscaping. It is also used to do a whiteboard mapping. Probably you have engines which can tell you which is the area where you could probably launch a patent. 
because it does the entire analysis of all the patents filed and probably give you out the gray area or the white area where probably something can come in. So then my question was, can I actually use an AI to create a patent? Who knows? Extracts from Wipo. Wipo recently came out with a publication. They wanted all the countries, member countries to tell what they are doing with the AI. And I found an interesting information. I found responses from different countries on how they are using AI in the IP world. And here it is, Australia. You might not be able to read it, but this is exactly what they are doing. So, sorry? World Intellectual Property Organization. That's where your uh, patents, etc., could be filed. If you want to do a common filing across the 33 nation or 23 nation, whatever it is, you can do a common filing and it gets affected across the globe. It has got its own process. WIPO also has a domain dispute uh, related cell where if somebody has copied your domain, you can escalate and get it resolved. And this is very effective, I've done it. This is Australia's response to the query raised by WIPO. This is Austria. As far as Austrian patent office is concerned, I would like to inform you that we are currently in trial period with several commercial provisions and field pre-search, pre-classification and classification, still being in evaluation phase. Unfortunately, we are not yet in a position. So something has already triggered. Some people, countries are using it. Brazil, initiative by the means of neural network focused towards pre-classification and distribution of applications among the technical division, SISCAP. However, there is an urgent need to regard of adequacy, which implies learning and retra uh, retraining process. This is Brazil. This is Canada. Their response on where the AI is being used. This is China. The earlier session we were talking about China. This is what China is. It's actually a long this thing dossier, but I just restricted it to this particular area. The other field, so ideally this is where your IP is now. Countries, this they had responded to WIPO in English, luckily, luckily. Because I have now a scenario where I am uh, approaching the Chinese government in terms of a cyber uh, related issue uh, and they have asked for the translation of the order and the letter of request in Chinese. Standard Madrid and I am actually trying to figure out who can do it, which we have already started. <laughs> So essentially, this is a topography of how AI is used in the intellectual property domain. Moving on, prediction and litigation. This is very interesting. You're actually going to forecast how a judge is going to react to a scenario. Now, the self-explanatory, you are trying to analyze all the data that are there. You are seeing a pattern of the judge who has passed a ju judgment right from his day of uh, inception to the current stage and you are trying to analyze how he's going to react in a particular scenario. Yeah, absolutely. We actually, when lawyers, when we go inside a courtroom, uh, the first thing that we do is study the body language. How is he reacting in the morning? What is he reacted earlier? What points I should press? What points I should not press for? So if he's very agitated, I'll just keep quiet and lordship I'm at your mercy because probably he has a fight at home, he did not get the tea properly, the sugar was less or more, we don't know. For me, the client's case is very important, so I'll say, Lordship, I'm at your mercy. So, time is running. So, these are other areas. This is one where application where artificial intelligence lawyer has already been inducted by the SFO in UK to deal with the analysis of uh, the fraud that was allegedly done by Rolls-Royce. IBM Watson, Watson, everyone is available, uh, aware of this. There's other deep blue which was used earlier by IBM. Judicial system, can we actually use this to give judgments? My take is the absence in a ju judgment is the human element, the emotional em element. These two are critical factors. Uh, as we are running down the time, I'll just try to skip this. Regulation, self-driving cars, committing accidents, killing people, who is responsible? These accidents have happened. Killer drones. You have drones which are used in Afghanistan to bombard. Now they are going to fill it with AI, which is connected with a satellite and which will decide whom to finish and finish it off. So where does all this come? Security and privacy. We had a discussion in the morning as to what happens if the data is skewed. It can go for a toss. 
child sex bots, these were there available in the market which were removed out after a lot of protests, but still you know the black market. Autonomous skill, that is the drones that I was talking about. Labor displacement, like in the morning we had a discussion saying that hey you have to adapt. There are a lot of people out, what will they adapt to if the works is totally going to move on to AI? These are the social uh, backfires, lashes that you could see once you, robotics, robots came in, blue color jobs were lost in US. They are still not able to replace it. What happened to those people? Upskill. One way is upskill yourself. Keep learning. So government across are trying to do a lot of things. This is the Chinese government's whole uh, land, the, the entire uh, plan of action in terms of AI to 2013. Create a leading AI innovation personal training basis by 2030, 2020, all these are there. EU, EU has already started talking about filing, drafting a regulation for the AI. This is what this, this is, this is a very recent one as uh, recent as 9th March. You have, okay, what are current available scenarios? There is something called right to explanation which I would insist should become a fundamental right. What a right of explanation does is in case in US you have a credit rating which comes and it shows negative. You have a right for, to ask for an explanation on how did that algorithm arrive to this particular conclusion. You have your civil rating, suddenly you see a negative thing. Do we have it in India? No. This is the US scenario where it talks about credit action. Equal Credit Opportunity Act covers that. You have the European scenario where this has already been adopted, GDPR has got recital, recital 71 which takes care of that. Where your data is processed by a machine, you have every right to ask how it did it. France, France has also taken this aspect on how this algorithmic treatment is being done. These, this is just a simple thing which I picked up, the three laws of robotics which would be applicable to us as well. It should not injure a human being. There should not be, in, in case of a conflict, first law is there to be adopted. It, it should protect its own existence as long as it is not in conflict of rule 1 and rule 2. This is what should be the probably. Indian scenario, we have this already in discussion. National strategy for artificial intelligence AI for all, June 2018. This dossier has come out. What does it have? I have picked up relevant areas concerning our uh, regulation. You talk about privacy and security institution of data privacy, creating sectoral regulatory guidelines, suitable research. This is just the initial, uh, the policy philosophy on which they are moving objective. I have picked up the essential parts, dealing with privacy issues, that's what it, the dossier talks about. To establish data protection framework, there's already Sri Krishna committee data protection law which has already been published, government is working on it sectoral regulatory framework and right to explanation is being adopted here. Encourage AI developers to adhere to international standards. So there is a participation from all the uh, uh, different areas to contribute in terms of developing this particular regula uh, regulation. Uh, also looking at, but the major aspect I would like to focus apart from all this is where we are right now. Are we ready? You have technology and knowledge to deal complex techno-legal. Okay, you had a data theft. You went to the police station. I said, hey, I lost my data. Somebody stole it. The cop will say, what's the data? You are not going to be able to explain. He said, this is data. He will understand it. This is a car. This is a pen. Anything which is visible, which is tangential, they are able to tangible things. They are able to understand. But when you talk about the data theft, it's a pain. You have, we still don't have infrastructure wherein we need personnels who are trained to understand this complex kind of an issue. I deal with cyber crime, I deal with data theft and I know how much pain I undergo. Starting from lodging a simple complaint to getting an FIR, running it to the court, getting the person arrested, getting a charge sheet filed. There's a whole concept right from the grassroots to the judiciary to the system. The other interesting thing with Mr. Madhusudan talked about is evidence. How do I capture this evidence? How do I archive it? How long will I preserve it? These are very critical challenges. Laptop, I can just put it and shove it somewhere. After five years, the laptop is gone. Where is the evidence? Forensic, cyber forensic labs are required today to help us cope with all these aspects. 
There is a judiciary which requires the infrastructure. Today the courts you see are filled with papers. We need to go to zero paper. We need the judiciary to understand, appreciate all these technical developments. Only then we will be able to give some. My suggestion would be like as we have NCLT, we should have tribunal set up for dealing with these things, where we have experts a part of it to deal with all these aspects. Lawyers, of course, need to be geared up. And then there are the cross-border issues. Somebody stole a, a 94 crore stolen from Cosmo Bank. From the Swift, uh, Swift account transferred to Hong Kong, how are you going to retrieve it? Cross-border issues. So when we talk about AI and its issues, I think we have to globally understand the challenges and have an inclusive aspect to ensure that these things are taken care of. You have any issues, some, something goes wrong using an AI algorithm, who, are, who is going to be liable? Is it going to be a machine or is it going to be an individual company which has developed the AI? He is going to say, I just developed the program, it is learning on itself. These are the challenges that we are going to face, we don't have an answer immediately. But this is an overall scenario in terms of the AI and the legal field. I finished it one minute before the deadline. Thank you. Any questions? One side of the story is from the, you know, the people who are in, in, entangled into the legal side. But the other side is the judgment side. So this AI tools and all, is it actually anything done in India towards the other side, the judgment from, because you have got crores and crores of legal tangles available in the uh, judiciary, this one, if you, if you classify them, only a few, you know, a few act, uh, uh, like uh, property litigation, only very small area will occupy 100% of or 90% of the cases. So will that be helpful there? Sorry, I didn't. So Can you articulate it a little? See, basically what I'm trying to find out is here, from a user point of view, we are talking about all this, uh, like, you know, two litigants or, you know, not avoid a legal problem or like that. But from the judiciary point of view, uh, judges and other people, if they can be uh, using this kind of a system, can the judgment be uh, speeded up? Yeah. So is there anything being done on, the, on that it is, side? It is being done. There is a framework being created and government is investing heavily, trying to automate the judiciary. There used to be a time when we used to wait for the cause list to hit our doors and check for the matters for the next day. It will be at 11 o'clock at night. We have now automated cause list, which is put on the internet. We get an alert on the phone saying that next day your case is listed in so and so court. So things are gearing up. You have your judgment put on the public domain. So it is steadily moving out to paperless thing. I, I hear like uh, it's Supreme Court, they are trying to bring in a system where your entire submission has to be on a pen drive. Okay. I have one more question on the IP side. Um, is India really, uh, you know, enforceable even if you are actually putting a patent to uh, this one? Uh, is it enforceable? Uh, yeah. How how easy or difficult it is to get there? It is enforceable and there are a lot of judgments which have given the rulings where people have been successful. There are two dimensions to it, sir. One is the infringement. Second is identifying and gathering the evidence. And third is the litigation part. But yes, India has become vibrant and we have get, get it's now people are aware of these issues and yes, it has changed a lot. So when you, are, when you actually, just extend that question on the, uh, this one. See, I have, I have worked in US also, that time we, uh, you know, our company filed some nine patents. There, there were very strong legal, uh, this one, the lawyers also, you know, cheating is very, very difficult in the sense they take the idea from us and do by themselves. But is there any framework of that nature available in India uh, or is it just evolving? India is still evolving, sir. Okay. India is still evolving. Well, all these things A can actually play a part. Yeah. Sorry, you are you are completing something. No, no, all this AI can actually add a lot of value in the Absolutely, AI. absolutely. So we just had an IP review that we conducted recently. <clears throat> and I think um, one of the things that we've sort of informed is that if I have a freedom to operate search that is done, and I have a legal opinion um, that says that, you know, um, we're good, the FTO is positive, and then I can go and then market a particular product. It says that eventually if I infringe on some other IP, right, as long as I have a legal opinion, uh, my liability is still limited. I, I, I don't run into unlimited liability, right? Now, if I have artificial intelligence replacing the legal opinion, right, will that 
lead to unlimited liability or is it considered equivalent to legal opinion? There are two different aspects. You took a legal opinion in terms of launching a product. So that covered a legal aspect. When you are using an artificial intelligence to do a whiteboard mapping, you would automatically know what are the areas that are going to be infringed and what products you cannot launch. So you will already have filtered to that extent. Post that when you are launching and if you have an opinion with you, to that extent you are already protected. So let us remove the legal aspect. You have used an AI to identify or do a prior art search and based on that search you come across some product that you can launch. I think you are safe to a larger extent because that AI when you are using you are globally going to scan across the footprint of that particular uh, product. right? Your legal opinion is from the legal interpretation point of view. Doesn't mean that you will be absolved. Somebody wants to, have you heard about patent trolls? You have answered it, right? So no matter what you do, there are going to be patent trolls, you are going to come after you. You will still need a lawyer. <laughs> India is seeing a lot of uh, pending cases, right? Uh, so how AI can help us in that aspect and uh, what sort of obstacles you are seeing AI picking up, uh, speeding up the process? Very nice question. The answer to this is the codification of the laws. Like I said, smart contracts are being codified into a machine language. If we are able to codify the acts into a machine language, we would probably eliminate the initial set of issues and probably bring down the litigation. Why does a litigation happen? Because invariably you have a dispute with the other person or the other person is actually there to do his business itself is to litigate. So if you have these smart contracts already in place, you would have filtered a great number of litigation being filed. Now the scenario in terms of filing, if you are equipping the courts and the system with all this technology, that can drastically drop to a great extent. Today in India, what happens is you litigate because you know I can sleep over it for 10 years. I can file a case against you and it can be sitting there for 10 years, 20 years. Suddenly after 10 years, you will get a summons from the court. Gentlemen, please be present. So all that has to be made transparent and that's where the technology can help us. Thank you, Any Srinath. Questions? Thank please you. give him a good hand. Thank you. And that's nice. Request Sridhar Kalyan Raman to kindly hand over a memento to the speaker. How important was the topic to you? Start. Next. You're not showing the results. Yeah, this is the next one. How satisfied are you with the usefulness of the information presented? Next. All of you have your voting pads. Quality of presentation material. Seventy. Next. It's getting repeated. Next to Skip this one, please. Okay. Ah, don't bother. Thank you so much. The next one. Was the presentation level advanced or elementary? That's all. Thank you so much.